Um, good evening. My name is Cheryl Breyer. Caitlin's also here. She's our data enrollment manager. She's um, in the back. Um, I'm an executive assistant here and just wanted to say thank you to everyone in person and online for joining us. Um, this is your first time at a gifted support group meeting. We try to hold meetings once a month, either in person with we're starting to add the live uh, Zoom component just so more people can attend, um, but it's always nice to be here in person, so thank you. Um, uh, and now I'd like to introduce Cassie Peter. Casey Peters. Casey Peters. Yes. Oh, I keep thinking that. Um, and I'll, I'll give a little bit of information about you. Um, you are a passionate advocate for gifted and twice exceptional children and their families. You have served on the boards of many gifted organizations, including SENG, um, Proud, Profoundly Gifted Retreat, Gifted Homeschoolers Forum, you have a certificate in gifted and talented education and a graduate student at Bridges Graduate School of Cognitive Diversity. Um, also the co-founder of Westside and Los Angeles Gifted and Square Pegs, supporting the gifted families through parent groups and individual consulting around alternative educational opportunities. And you are someone who has been homeschooling for two gifted children since 2012, um, and also a board certified music therapist, primarily working with children who have special needs. Yes. So, Thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. Um, and show you presentation. Awesome. Okay, so um, just a couple of words before we start. Thank you so much for coming. But both of my kids are UNASA campers, so they've been since um, for the last five years camping. Some of them are big fans of IEA. Um, and so I really appreciate being asked to come and speak here tonight. I'm really thrilled. I love to talk about homeschooling. So we could go to the next slide. Um, Cheryl's going to do the slides for me for tech reasons. So as she mentioned, I'm founder of Square Pegs, and we support families who are looking to transition into alternative education methods um, from a brick and mortar school. So you already gave like my technical bio, but mostly I'm mom to two twice exceptional kids. And my husband is uh, profoundly gifted, also likely twice exceptional. And a little bit of our story, my son, this is him on the left, our salmon shirt, <laughs> is currently 17. And he graduated from homeschooling in May of 2022 at age 16. Um, he's currently in a gap year right now. And then in the fall, he's attending Oberlin um, College and Conservatory for their double degree program in piano performance and chemistry. So he's um, been homeschooled since he was six years old. He did about six months in kindergarten. And then we were like, we can't do this anymore for a variety of reasons, which if you want, we can talk about um, later. And my daughter next to him is Felicity. She is 13 and she's never been to school. Um, when we pulled my son out, um, we realized that our whole philosophy of education was like flipped on end. And we just really appreciated everything about homeschooling. And so she's never been in a traditional um, or mainstream school environment. And she's pretty different from my son in terms of like, she's less academically motivated, though equally as capable. Um, she's my artist, she's a violinist, she's a musical theater kid, she's a creative, she's a singer. Um, and so we've been able to make homeschooling work with two very, very different kids. Um, and so you can go to the next slide, please. So our agenda for tonight, um, this is a QR code if you want to grab the slides. I also have the QR code at the end, so you can just, you don't have to take pictures of anything. The slides are here, um, and the code will be at the end as well. So we're going to talk about the logistics and definitions and legalities of homeschooling um, in California primarily, but just a little bit outside of the state. Um, different homeschooling approaches, some pros and cons, some myths, a lot about social development, because that's a big piece that I think a lot of people are concerned about. Some considerations um, if you're thinking about homeschooling or thinking about continuing homeschooling, and then we'll have discussion. Okay, but first we'll have a little joke. Mm -hmm. How does a homeschooler change a light bulb? <laughs> first, someone checks three books on electricity out from the library. Then the children make models of light bulbs, read a biography of Thomas Edison, and do a skit based on his life. Next, everyone studies the history of lighting methods, wrapping up with dipping their own candles. Then everyone takes a trip to the store where they compare types of light bulbs and their prices, figuring out how much change they'll get if they buy two bulbs for $1.99 and pay with a $5 bill. On the way home, a discussion develops over the history of money and also Abraham Lincoln since his picture is on the $5 bill. Finally, after building a homemade ladder out of 
branches dragged from the woods, the light bulb is installed and there is light. <laughs> so while that's a bit of a joke and an exaggeration, there is likely a, quite a bit of truth in that and how we homeschool um, and how we live in general with our gifted or twice exceptional children, whether you're homeschooling or not, with their deep need for diving deep, for understanding things, for asking questions, for studying concepts on all levels. So um, there's a lot of reality to that. And this is really homeschooling at its simplest, learning and living by doing and being in life, questioning and answering and combining all subjects at the same time. Next slide. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about my definition of homeschooling which is alternative education that occurs outside of a traditional brick and mortar school and does not necessarily follow a standard curriculum established by the state or federal government. Homeschooling is a misnomer unless rec recreating school at home with parent as teacher and occurs on a spectrum from a more mainstream schooling at home method to rad radical unschooling. And I think like the word gifted, homeschooling is sort of a best choice word, but not really the most accurate um, description of the kinds of things that happen when you're outside of the brick and mortar environment. So legally speaking, can go to the next slide. The legalities of homeschooling vary by state and country. So if you're not from California on the Zoom call um, and you wanna know more, you can Google your state plus homeschool association or state plus homeschool regulations. Some states are really lax with their requirements and some are much more strict. Many states have attendance and hours of instruction requirements um, with varying degrees of rep required reporting. So in California, we can go to the next slide. Cal um, homeschooling is not actually recognized in California. Um, so there are ways to actually homeschool. Um, one is enrolling in a charter school, which sounds like you do that. Do you guys all do a homeschool charter? Charter school, charter school, okay. So, School. Okay, the PSA. Okay, so um, the homeschool charter is basically like being enrolled in a public school where you're a student, um, you are assigned an educational specialist, and you have requirements to meet work samples um, to provide on a monthly basis, attendance to take, most likely standardized testing required. Um, however, you do receive a small amount of money, not too small actually, um, that you can use for classes, for approved vendors, for materials that you might need for homeschooling, um, for uh, tutors and that kind of thing. Um, and you can get a report card and you're basically considered part of the, of the system. Um, the private school affidavit is basically you filing for your own very small school where you are the admin, you're the, you're the principal, you're the teacher, and your children are your students. Um, in that situation, there are no requirements. So you file the form once a year, and then you are left to your own devices on educating your kids, um, however you see fit. Um, one more step from that is the private school satellite program, which is basically when you when you enroll in someone else's PSA. So now I think that's not the most common way of doing it, but that means someone else takes care of the paperwork. Um, you can also enroll in an online school that's an accredited school, or you can enroll in a hybrid school, which is basically where you attend a traditional school a couple of times a week. The rest of the time you participate in their curriculum. So we can go to the next slide. And we'll talk a little bit about some homeschooling approaches. Next slide. Thanks. So the online school, um, we talked about that with some examples are Laurel Springs, Davidson Young Scholars, which is geared toward gifted, um, Fusion Academy, Futures Academy, um, and then Kava or K-12, which is not geared toward gifted, but these are all accredited public K-12 schools. Another option is to choose courses from online service providers, some of them geared toward gifted, some of them not. Um, Athena's Advanced Academy and Online G3 are excellent examples of online providers who are geared toward gifted and have an application process, so you are with like-minded learners. Um, another like Next Level Homeschool is one, PA Homeschoolers, there's just a lot of options for online um, Coursework. And then outschool.com is a great resource, not geared toward gifted, but has a wide, wide variety of courses that you can choose from. Um, community classes for homeschoolers. So IEA offers a bunch of classes. Um, I live on the West Side. Uh, so my references are basically from their creative homeschoolers, 
the realm of STEAM, urban homeschoolers, I think is more on the east side. Um, you can school at home, traditional schooling with parent as teacher, recreating school at home. Then there's unschooling or child-led learning, which is basically following the child's interest, letting them guide the learning based on their level of engagement within certain subjects. Um, with unschooling, there's not really requirements. I mean, there's family requirements, but there's not academic requirements. There's not um, any, you don't have to, you're not forced to study any specific subjects or have any kind of schedule or routine um, unless and until, this is my part, unless and until the child requests it. Cause I consider ourselves unschoolers or some kind of a mix of unschooling. Um, but my kids take classes because they ask for them and they want to. So I think like the radical unschoolers might say that's not unschooling, but this is their request. So I'm, you know, um, project based would be similar to child led where the kid is involved in choosing projects and choosing subjects and topics and guiding the learning there, but the outcome is a project and the presentation is based on projects. Um, many people do a relaxed eclectic combination of the above methods. Um, I think that's what most people tend to do. Then there's these other Charlotte Mason, Waldorf, Montessori, Thomas Jefferson, and classical homeschooling um, tend to be the more traditional approaches that are very structured um, approaches to homeschooling. There's a little quiz down here on my slides. Um, what kind of homeschooler you are. It's like a little boat quiz. It's not like official or anything, but it is kind of fun. And it does help you think about what you value as a homeschooler. So um, we can go to the next slide. And then I feel like I would be remiss, you can go to the next one too, to um, not talk about some of the pros of brick and mortar school, which is access to expert teacher, teachers and resources, um, their extracurricular and sports programs, the presence of age peers. Um, if you're working, it's a safe environment for your kids to be in, hopefully, um, during the day. If you are in public school, it's cost effective and then the access to special education services. So we can move on from there. The cons of brick and mortar school, I want to be careful talking about this, but really um, teachers don't get hardly any training in giftedness and especially not in twice exceptionality. So your child may be misunderstood um, and at a high risk for misdiagnosis. If you have untraditional or unconventional behaviors, um, if you're acting out due to boredom, if you are having impulse control because of like psychomotor overexcitabilities, or if you're displaying a sensory processing challenges because the air conditioning goes on or the lights go on, are buzzing, you can't focus, you might be referred out for ADHD or autism referral. Um, and so you're mis misdiagnosed, which doesn't happen in homeschooling. You may have this, um, may need this identification, but you also may not because you're able to really set up your um, environment to help you develop skills to cope in situations later in life as your maturity catches up. So um, the resources may not suit your child's learning needs, very one size fits all in the box kind of thinking. Um, while there are age peers, there might not be like-minded peers or interest-based peers or appropriate um, peers for you. You might be at risk for bullying. Our kids are sometimes unconventional. Um, Private school is expensive. There's very rarely individualization, even within a gifted program in a school, it's still a one size fits all gifted um, experience. So um, you might experience a lack of individual intellectual challenge. Um, and then the big one for me with homeschooling and brick and mortar is the deficit or medical model versus a strength-based model. So our schools have to remediate challenges. They have to focus on what's wrong so that everyone can pass. Um, so there is a very, uh, it's not balanced. And our kids often feel like, okay, I have to spend all my time learning how to handwrite when really I just want to speak what I want or I want to, you know, share what I know in a different way. So um, homeschooling can be strength-based. We'll talk about that later. But most of the time, if you have challenges, that's what is focused on um, in a school environment. So we're going to talk a little bit about homeschooling myths. Um, the first one is that my child needs to learn to be in the world and can't always just do what he or she wants. So homeschoolers live in the real world every single day. Um, they interact with their communities in practical and meaningful ways. Um, they, we as homeschoolers value educational autonomy. So it is true 
that we often allow our children the freedom to direct their learning, um, which means we create a life that we're excited about. And we aren't feeling like we're forced to comply because we're happy with what our choices are. Um, or we don't have to live by the rules of others. So because we're intrinsically motivated, because we seek meaning, because we have an understanding of why we're doing what's being asked of us, we often can comply. When we have to get up early to catch a flight, we can get up early to catch a flight. So our homeschooled kids will be able to maintain the job. If they're not morning people, they probably won't be a barista at 4 a.m. at the Starbucks because that's not how they will have structured their life. But if that's what they want to do, they absolutely will figure out a way to be a barista. Um, so when faced with non-preferred activities, homeschoolers are definitely capable um, because they spend, also because most of their time is spent in meaningful ways. They're, they're not, like I think our school kids have a lot of their time wasted um, and they have a lot of time where their time is dictated for them, like what they have to be doing. So then when as a parent, we say, also, I need you to come run this errand with me, or we have to go to this doctor's appointment, or we have to go to this grandma's birthday party, you might have more resistance because they've just been doing what other people ask them to do for a whole week. And now we're asking them to do more. Whereas homeschoolers, it's kind of the opposite. We can ask them to go to the birthday party because they just spent their whole week, you know, reading a favorite novel. Um, so I think we can move on to the next one. My child needs to tolerate boredom. I think we do not need to create opportunities for frustration or boredom for our gifted or twice exceptional kids. That is built into life, um, especially for them. Many things are mundane. So they are learning frustration tolerance. Um, we don't have to create these situations for them. And we as adults would never tolerate coming to a boring talk, um, staying in the boring talk, or hopefully we aren't tolerating working a job that just kills us, you know, creatively or is so mundane that we, you know, hardly can tolerate it. Hopefully we have that, you know, ability to change um, and participate in a meaningful life. But we're asking a lot of times our children, you know, to stay in these boring situations, which actually is a leading cause of underachievement, of learned helplessness of depression and then rage. So we end up really, our children um, deserve much better than sitting in, in a, not being challenged intellectually in whatever environment they're in. We can go to the next one. Homeschoolers are socially awkward, isolated and lonely. Um, so I wrote this little thing, I'm gonna just read it because I think it explains it pretty well that social skills and schooling type are primarily unrelated. Homeschoolers thrive socially as extroverts and they thrive socially as introverts. If a child is gonna thrive socially, he or she will. If they're going to struggle socially, he or she will. Um, in fact, those with strong social skills actually benefit from allowing those strengths to shine in a homeschool environment. They're given ample opportunity to hone skills in leadership and friendship and collaboration. And those who lag in social skills are provided the time and space to develop skills in a no pressure supportive atmosphere. And often those kids will shine in homeschool social situations because homeschool families and communities celebrate diversity, unique personalities, and tolerate different skill levels. So kids are allowed to simply be who they are and develop confidence without peer pressure. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. And we're gonna talk about social development versus socialization. So social socialization, the process of internalizing the norms and ideologies of society, Socializing encompasses both learning and teaching, and is thus the means by which social and cultural continuity are attained. So this is conformity. This is going along to get along. This is following the rules that are in place. It's classroom management. It's what's required to manage a class of 26 students at a time. So this is the model that schools have to use. Um, Often the socializing is limited to lunch and recess, where there's not much supervision. So who knows what kind of quality interactions are happening. These opportunities are limited to same age, same grade, same gender, um, which is not conducive to how our gifted kids operate in the world. Um, and we, our kids often end up masking their giftedness or compensating for their twice exceptionalities in the classroom and then falling apart at home because it's so much work to stay regulated versus if we move on to social development, 
um, which refers to the process by which a child learns to interact with others around them. As they develop and perceive their own individuality within the community, they also gain skills to communicate with other people and process their actions. Social development most often refers to how a child develops friendships and other relationships, as well as how a child handles conflicts with peers. So which would you like to see as the focus <laughs> for your child's development, right? Schools focus on socialization, whereas homeschoolers tend to focus on social development. So it's an important component. We aren't really interested in conformity or fitting in, but we are interested in developing relationships, developing self-awareness, developing communication skills, developing conflict resolution skills, developing, helping our child children develop who they are and how figuring out where they fit in the world and how to be who they are while also getting along well with others. Um, okay, so we can go to the next. So, you know, schools definitely provide built-in social opportunities for students and parents through their open houses, their festivals, concerts, sporting events, fundraisers, those kinds of things. They also have built-in collaborative learning opportunities, science projects, book group reports, plays, different kinds of things like that, um, and then their extracurricular activities. So, you know, you do find that. And then, um, but really, if we go to the next slide. The pros of homeschooling on social development. We have the freedom to be as social as we want and need, which also can vary given, the, given any specific circumstances. So we can have a lot of socialization and then we have the freedom to have a week of downtime if we need. We can figure out if we wanna be social in our academics or separate academics from socializing. Um, so we really have freedom to make choices around our social needs. Um, we have diverse and expansive social groups, so often great social experiences come from mixing ages, mixing genders, parents of other homeschooling kids make great um, intellectual peers often. Um, the efficiency of homeschooling allows for ample time for socializing, so you are, you know, getting your schoolwork done or however you're doing it or it's all incorporated, um, but then there is time. Um, and then what, like I talked about before, you can develop at your own pace and you're free to be who you are without comparing yourself to others. So you don't need to have like the latest pair of Air Jordans or you don't need to, you know, um, compare how, how tall you are with how tall your friends are. Um, and there's opportunities for deep bonds based on shared interests. It doesn't matter if someone's five and someone's 12. If Pokemon is your thing, Pokemon is your thing. Um, and then asynchronous, asynchronous development requires access to a wide variety of peer groups. Um, so with homeschooling, like we talked about with Pyrick, um, there's a lot of opportunity to mix grades, mix ages, mix genders, um, and meet those needs. So we can move on. So the cons, there are some cons of homeschooling on social development. You have to seek out your community. It's not just there. So you have to be creative. You have to be proactive. You have to reach out to people. Um, you're not just going to bump into somebody after school and be like, hey, can you have a play date? Um, you may be susceptible to judgments by the community. Like when you're out at the park or out with a friend somewhere during the day and they say, hey, why aren't you in school? Oh, you're homeschooling. You know, my favorite though is when somebody says to me, Oh, your kids are so well behaved. And oh, well, we, we, um, why aren't they in school? Well, we're homeschooling. Oh, well, where are they getting their socializing? Wait, you just said they're so well behaved. You know, now you're saying, wait, what about socializing? Um, and then the transition to homeschooling may result in a loss of already established friendships for kids and parents and caregivers. So that, that is a real, um, consideration. I mean, it's a process and it did happen to us when we, left our school environment, all intentions to stay in touch. And then you do sometimes, but it is a real um, risk. So we're gonna go into some pros and cons of homeschooling. Their pros are way bigger. <laughs> There's way more. So homeschooling is the ultimate in individualized education. This is a strength-based learning model. Um, so for example, my daughter is, uh, her strength is art. Like she's very creative. It's not just like visual arts, but performing arts. We talked about that before. So we're able to infuse art into everything she does. Um, and 
while I'm being careful not to make art a chore, like, oh, I need you to do math. So let's do art with math. I'm like, not that. But like, if she has an interest in something, we can use art as an entry point. Um, and we can use art to sort of develop skills that need help, um, need further development. Um, like, for example, she has been a reluctant reader. She loves content. She loves listening to audiobooks, but she's not much for reading a hard copy of a book until recently. She realized she could make a book art um, by highlighting different, she assigned different colors to different characters. She assigned, then she started using sticky tabs um, to like indicate different things. Like one was like, oh, this is a silly thing that happened. So she'd use a blue tab and then, or this is a meaningful, sad thing, or this is strong character development. And she ended up reading um, Six of Crows. It's like a novel like this big. And it's beautiful. Like when you look at the pages, it's just she colored, she coordinated the colors um, to the cover of the book. So it's so beautiful. I wish I would have taken a picture. And then she did it with the, the next novel in the series. She read it. She started off actually listening to the audio and reading at the same time. And then she is transitioned to just reading. And so then she was doing combinations, but constantly marking it up and writing in the margins and writing down her thoughts. And like, it was so beautiful because she made art with this task that has been challenging for her and it became meaningful. And we trusted the process that she would get there with reading and, and she has, and we just took her to Barnes and Noble, she wrote six more books and she's been in her bed all day reading today. And she's like, I wanna keep reading. And she's just reading. And I didn't know this day would ever actually come. <laughs> Um, but she did. And so the, so her strength in art has really helped her develop in this, this skill of reading. Um, and then interest-based learning. Um, I want to talk about that a little bit. My son has always been a deep diver into one area of interest. And once it was roller coasters and it was like all he wanted to ride the roller coasters um, and to talk about roller coasters. And we were able to infuse physics um, acceleration and like launching and like what kind of launch was it? Is it a lift hill or is it a launch or what, you know, what are the magnets? Um, math and statistics, which ones are the highest, which ones are the fastest, which ones are the longest? Um, geography, he learned where all the major theme parks were and he was like on the floor with the map and some pins, like which ones he wanted to go to. So he learned states. Um, and then he was in a public speaking class. So he had to research a topic. So he researched roller coasters. Um, he did a ton of reading on that and then he gave a speech about it. So it was like all kinds of um, subjects into one, from one interest. And that is a really uh, big pro of um, homeschooling. And then promotes autonomy and control of education. We're not being told what to learn or how to learn or when to learn. We can really follow our interests and, and we can sustain our curiosity. We're all born curious, asking so many questions of why, and then it goes away. People are just telling us what we need to learn. Um, we can choose an a la carte curriculum that focuses on appropriate academic level. So we can accelerate where needed and we can go, we can delay where needed. We can work at grade level when needed. Um, it's really finding the exact right educational fit per subject. Um, we as parents can observe our child and determine what their, what their needs are. We can work toward mastery instead of perfection. And so for our kids who have perfectionistic tendencies, this is great because there's no A to earn. It's let's, let's um, integrate, let's learn the concept until we master it um, and then move on or keep going. But we're not on a time frame either, and we're not subject to external evaluation. So we can focus on the process. Um, we can focus on learning how to learn, which is a life skill. Um, we can be engaged meaningfully in learning experiences just for the joy of learning. Um, access to real world learning opportunities, like, like starting book clubs, like visiting museums, like going on field trips, like talking to the docents. Um, and then we have opportunities for creative, divergent thinking and deep dives into subjects. So when we're inspired, we can go deep and we can spend time doing those things. Um, okay. It's also ultimately or ultra flexible. Um, we can differentiate to accommodate and support asynchrony. We can change to, uh, we can adjust to changing circumstances. Um, so like for right now, we're very busy in our performance season for both of our kids. So our academics are like, 
um, hold um, for a while because we have too much violin practice and too much theater practice. And um, so that is what our focus is on now, but that's okay because we can make up the work or we can pivot. Um, or if there's an illness or doctor's appointments, like we have the freedom and flexibility to pivot. Um, we also have a risk-free environment to develop new skills. I think this is important. When our gifted kids are given an gifted identity, identification in school, they may learn to be afraid to, to take a risk, to try something new, because then what happens to their identity as a gifted individual if they fail, right? So that's a big deal. Um, and in homeschooling, you know, they may know they're gifted, but there's no, we, we have a risk-free, safe environment for trying new things. In fact, it's celebrated. So we can also manage or avoid environmental distractions. Like this is creating the environment where our kids, if it's working under the table, if it's reading upside down, we take breaks as needed. Um, and we can demonstrate mastery of material in unique and creative ways. Like my daughter with her book, she can show me what she learned by the colors of her tabs. And I can see a physical manifestation of the time spent, you know, in this book. Okay. There are health benefits. Um, we have an increase in well-being because there's less pressure. There's less rushing. There's fuel, ex fewer external um, expectations. We can listen to our bodies. We can eat when we're hungry. We can sleep when we're tired. We can use the bathroom when, when we need to use the bathroom, um, which can decrease anxiety in the whole family. We can potentially avoid misdiagnosis. We talked about that. Um, and avoid issues of compensating and masking. We don't have to hold it together. We can free to be who we are. And we can develop life skills and mindsets um, for our family values. Like we can model, parents can be models for their kids and what they need. Um, like they can learn nutrition and we can learn exercise and we can learn persistence and grit and all of those like soft skills that we can um, really benefit us throughout our lives. And then we can strengthen relationships through homeschooling. Um, family and sibling relationships can be strong. My kids make tons of music together, tons of music together. Board games. We learn We learn together and we learn at the same time, not all the time. And there is conflict, but it's not. Um, we have a lot of time together, so it's very real. Um, and we have opportunities to find like-minded peers. We talked about that a little bit, where it's not just your same grade, your same age, but if your interest has a similar interest, um, but not just similar interests, but similar life philosophies, right? Like when you're with a group of homeschoolers, the way adults who homeschool their ch children talk to other children is qualitatively different than the way adults who have their kids in mainstream talk to their children. Um, opportunities to work with mentors and experts who are not teachers. So my daughter had a favorite teacher when she was at the realm when she was five years old and she taught early literacy and math. And we outgrew that class, but this was when she was five and she's 13 now and she still meets on Zoom with this person who the relationship has switched. They do like art journaling and poetry, um, but they meet twice a week as a mentor. They have very similar personalities. So my daughter can look up to someone who is like her, can see her happy, can see how she has created her life to work for her. Um, increase access to intergenerational relationships, like more grandparents, more cousins, more aunts and uncles, more neighbors. Um, and you can choose your role models. I often tell people who work with my kids, like, you must be great because I'm very picky about who has access to my kids. Right. Like you don't just get to influence them. You don't just get to. And um, we as homeschoolers have a it's great power, the great responsibility to figure out who gets to be the ones who influences our kids. Um, so there are some cons to homeschooling, like losing your spot in a brick and mortar school, especially a private school. Um, if you are in a charter school and you have an IEP or a 504, you maintain your IEP in 504. If you are filing a PSA, you may lose that. You also may not need it. Like that is another thing is you may need a 504 IEP accommodations, adaptations in your um, in a school, but you may not need them when you're creating the environment for your, that your child needs. So yes, it's a con to lose that 504 IEP, but it really may not actually be necessary as a homeschooler. The pressure to get it right is on your shoulders. You can't be like, oh, the school messed that up. Um, 
you messed that up. <laughs> <laughs> but actually it's fine, right? Like you can be flexible and shift gears, right? So, um, and I don't know, I've seen it work out. So Rick has seen it work out. <laughs> we, we, you know. So this, the scheduling challenges can be real, especially when you're enrolling in classes that are sometimes eight weeks, sometimes 16 weeks, and you're constantly evaluating, are we too busy? Are we not busy enough? When can I fit this in? When you're balancing multiple kids, it can be kind of a juggling act. Um, dealing with stereotypes and judgment is real. Initial loss of built-in community, like if you pulled out of school. And then it can be expensive, not nearly as expensive as sending your kids to private school. Um, but you know, you can work and it can be cost effective, but um, there are costs associated with homeschooling. Um, okay, so now what? <laughs> if you are planning to homeschool, if you guys know about de-schooling, so this is the process, uh, the adjustment period to go through when you're leaving a school and beginning homeschooling to really understand if homeschooling will work for your family. A child has to decompress and disconnect from school being the default and school ways being the standard expectation. Um, you can't really de-school on a school break. Like a lot of people say to me, oh, I'm gonna try homeschooling on spring break or I'm gonna try homeschooling over the summer. You can't do that because you, even over the summer when it's a couple of months long, the first month they're decompressing and the second month they're building back up to the getting ready to go back. So you, the child that you homeschool is not the same child that attends a school environment, right? So a lot of families are concerned, like my child doesn't comply, my child is, like full of anxiety or has behavior problems, a lot of times those things will go away um, when you're homeschooling. But you can't do it on a break. Um, and parents need to de-school also because we went through the system. So most of us. Um, so we have ideas about how we think things should be. And even after 10 years or 11 years of doing this, I still have to remind myself it doesn't have to be this way that I'm used to it being. It doesn't have to be that way. So um, the, the way of thinking is that one month of de-schooling per year of school. So I want to go to the next slide. The pros of and cons. So the pros, you can observe how your child learns best, when they learn best, where they learn best. There's an opportunity for strewing things. So that just means placing things of interest in their path. You can in explore interests and passions and motivation, which improves buy-in, which our kids need to have, right? Like if you're thinking of pulling your kid out of school in middle school, they need to have buy-in. You can't just do it. So the more you can add um, things of interest for them, the more you can say, hey, let's go travel here. Or, hey, let's go visit this. The more likely they'll see, oh my gosh, I'm going to have time for that, right? So you have time to think about what you value as a family, in terms of your education and how you spend your time. It's time to reconnect, time to re-engage your curiosity. A lot of times parents will say, my kid's not interested in anything, which is false. They just don't know what they're interested in and they don't know how to figure that out because by this point, people have already told them this is what's important and they don't know for themselves. So this gives them time to figure it out and to decompress from the pressures, um, figure out how you wanna spend your time. The cons are that it's very hard to be patient and trust the process as a parent. You may look like at your kid like they're lazy and they're not doing anything. They don't have motivated motivation. They wanna watch YouTube. They wanna play video games. They may be participating in things you find very not valuable at all. Um, they may, you may feel pressure from family and friends to add structure. And there may be tension in the family between the parent and the child. They're like, come on, just get out of bed. Right. And so um, those are some things to work through. And then I'm almost done. So let's just do the next slide. Suggestions for getting started. Prioritize parental self-care. A lot of times gifted homeschoolers come to homeschooling from a place of crisis. Right. Like that's what happened to us. We we had to get out. And I hadn't had time to like build up who I was yet as a person. Like, I thought, OK, my kids are going to go to school. I'm done with this early childhood. I'll figure out. And all of a sudden we're in crisis and they're here with me full time. I'm like, still, who am I? I guess I'm this now. <laughs> but, um, so if you love hip hop dancing, if you have a book club, if you have a thing that you love, it blocks in your schedule and you are very inflexible about moving that thing. If the gym is your thing, you put it in and you leave it in. Um, 
consider your environment. So one-on-one, -on -one, maybe you need one-on-one -on -one for math. Maybe you need small group for science and maybe you do online language arts. Like you figure out based on the subjects, how they learn best. And again, include your kid. It's a collaborative process. Customize the schedule for optimal learning times. Find others of similar interests. Um, we talked about considering what you value. And we talked about the buy-in. Gifted kids have to be part of this. What works for most kids may not work for a gifted child, right? They're outside the box. They're divergent thinkers, which also these characteristics make them prime candidates for homeschooling. Um, and then as a parent, check in with your family. Are their needs being met? What is missing? Are they happy? But you're stressed? If they're happy, maybe you don't have to worry so super much. Separate your ideas of what you think they need, right? Like we've been kind of ingrained with the school mindset. Separate your ideas of what you think they need from what they actually need. If they're okay, that's okay, right? And your relationship always comes first in homeschooling. I mean, it should always anyways, but um, especially in homeschooling. So start before you're ready. You will never be fully prepared for this. I am still not. <laughs> if you would like more, you can go to the next slide. Um, I created the GHF Gifted Homeschoolers Forum DI Education Series. It's nine self-paced models. These are the nine models. When you get the QR code for the slides, this will link you there. It's free, self-paced. It's like really rich and really detailed. Um, next slide is community resources. This will be in your slide. I don't really think I need to talk about any of those particular, um, except mixed age settings. Like when you're looking for, uh, go to the next slide actually, please. When you're um, thinking about homeschooling and you go to a homeschool group in your area, some questions to ask, are you secular? Are you religious? So you know what you're getting into. Um, is it a co-op? Like what is expected of me in my time? And then flexible grouping or age-based, like are they flexible? if your five-year-old wants to join up with the eight-year-old or are they real rigid about that? So that's with kind of anything for gifted kids. Um, what's their philosophy? And, you know, what's the, like all these things are questions that you can ask. Um, these are some references and that you can have that when you get in. Then I think I'm finished. So if you go to the next slide, that is me. Those links will get you to me, I think. Um, Happy to talk with you. And then the next link, the next page is again, the QR code for this slide. Oh, and this is a document I created with a list of charter schools, lists of tutors, lists of online classes, that kind of thing. Um, that might be helpful. They're within local. This, hmm? Within this is the list. If you get the QR code on this slide and you click on that link. Okay. If that doesn't work, I don't know. And I'll send out um, the PDF of slides to everyone. Oh, tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay. You said 30 to 45. That's no, like 45 on the dot. Is that okay? <laughs> um, so I'll um, stop sharing um, the PDF. And, and as mentioned, in case someone didn't hear, I'll share out for everyone who RSVP, I'll share out um, Casey's presentations. So that way you have the. Um, Scan code, I forget what that's called. You are code. <laughs> code, sorry. Um, and then I'm going to stop recording because I'm not.